but uh, we want to get this evening uh, as many questions, as many responses as possible. So first of all, I'm going to call on Ian Patterson to uh, pose the first question. Ian? Very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, since uh, Mr. Judge has uh, helped to shift the question from whether we want an event center to whether we can afford it, at least for the next decade, let's deal with that question. Given the elevated municipal tax levels here compared to other similar community or Ontario cities, and along with the reduction in the industrial tax base, throw in the growing cost of provincially mandated services, is it your contention, all candidates, that middle and low income earners and those on fixed incomes can afford the tax increase that will result from building the event center. For those who do not agree, the city has insisted the tax increase will be minimal and mostly affordable. Do you simply not believe that contention? And if not, why not? Remember, the longer we wait to build an event center, the more it will cost. Okay, uh, maybe Shane, do you want to field that one first, please? Yeah, I, uh, I won't. Uh talk about the affordability per se, I'd like to start off perhaps with the question of whether or not the, the capital cost is reasonable, although at the end of the day, the capital cost doesn't much matter. It's how much it costs to operate each and every year. It builds in one to one and a half percent into the city's budget. And I think that's at the low percent. And I know how hard city councillors struggle each year to get the tax down to two, two and a half percent so that people could live with it. Now you build in one and to one and a half percent just from the get-go, the exercise of budget making becomes crazy, especially if you're still stuck with the Fort William Gardens because of the long-term contract. So another 600,000 built in. The waterfront, $600,000, which of course councillors didn't realize was going to be the case, but when you add up all these big infrastructure co uh, costs per annum, I don't believe, with all the other things we have to do, including that $200 million that I mentioned, that we have to fix our water system, upgrade our water system uh, towards over the next 20 years, okay, that this is you, affordable Shane. at all. Thank you. Uh, Doug McKay? Personally, I don't um, condone the the event center, uh, I would like to see a scaled down version of it. I just think it's too big for the, the amount of people we have in town. We don't have a uh, outside draw like Southern Ontario, so it's, it's very limited. So I like to see it scaled down. But my pr proposal to uh, legalize cannabis in this town would actually increase the, ta the tax base exponentially. And so, because everybody's fighting over the same pot of money, pardon the expression, so to actually increase the taxes from tourists and then make Thunder Bay a, 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 you know, a mecca for retirees because we got the baby boom thing going on and it'd be nice to have Thunder Bay a safe place for these retirees to come and that would increase the tax base. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Henry Wojcik. Henry? Yeah, I do not think we should be socializing the costs for this event center for people who may not be able to afford it. Our municipal burden is above the municipal average. People are paying 5.4% of their household income in property and water taxes compared to the Ontario average of 4.6%. Some people just cannot afford the luxury of going to this new event center. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Ken Boschkoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not against it, I just need real numbers. I'd vote in favour if the long-term benefits could be proven to be greater than the expenses. We should know this before Christmas. I voted against the million-dollar overrun that happened early in the game to send a message to our administration to ensure uh, that the cost accounting was going to get straightened out. At this time, it's just us taxpayers praying the federal government will change their national policy for our community and that the province will have enough, enough extra millions to do this. So, the other week we also heard that the financing would be partially debentured. We can't back down, you have to keep asking questions. We know that this project is inevitable and necessary, 
We need a replacement for the gardens. If we know in the next few weeks, then we can make the right decision. So that is my answer. I'm not against it. Let's see what the numbers are. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Colin? When it comes to the event centre, I said four years ago it should have gone to plebiscite. It doesn't matter what I want. It matters to what the people want. The taxes, with the loss of so many blue-collar jobs, can we really afford it? But that's up to you to decide, not us. I'm neither for or against it. I don't like the location, but as for taxes, we need to work on getting our jobs back that everybody lost in the mills, the railroad, etc. But this event centre, we're switching from on the south side of town, where it's too small, no parking, putting it to the north side of town, too small, and again, no parking, unless we take away areas that are already existing and being used for other things. So as for the event centre, it's up to the people. It should go to plebiscite. I would give it back to you to decide to go forward with it or not. Thank you. Keith? Thank you very much. Uh, I taught operational planning in my previous career and we have planned for four years for this event centre. We have dotted our I's and we have crossed our T's. We have looked at Kingston, Sault Ste. Marie, London. I'll give you an example of economic growth as a result. In London, in a five block radius of the Budweiser Centre, their tax assessment went up by $500 million. We're seeing the same thing with the IROC Centre in Kingston. We have said all along that if we don't get federal and provincial funding, we will not be building this. We've been four years in the planning. Um, we had $2.1 million assessment growth last year. Uh, we've got, I know some people don't like big box stores, but Costco's taxes alone will be a one-off on the operation of this facility. I hear lots about taxes. In the last 10 years before my tenure, 4.16% increases. In my tenure, 1.68 average tax assessment. We've been responsible and we're building our tax assessment, despite what you've heard. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. The next question will come from Vic Krasowski. Vic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I got to Thunder Bay about 30 years ago, the population was about 110,000 and now in 2014 the population of Thunder Bay is about 110,000. It's an issue that we've been grappling with for years. Nobody seems to know how to handle this so-called black hole for population growth. I'd like to hear what the candidate's position is on our population and it, its stagnation. Thank you, Vic. Uh, let's start this one with uh, Doug McKay. Doug? I actually didn't hear the question. Uh, I'm having trouble hearing. That oh, that is Vic, do you want to repeat that for? Uh, I was just speaking about the population growth or lack thereof in Thunder Bay for the longest period and what your thoughts were. So you want me to comment on the, the population? Yes, please. Well, uh, population isn't going to be growing. It's, I thought it was actually shrinking. Wasn't it 120,000 back in the 70s? And now it's, it's been, like, people aren't going to want to move here if we're, uh, we've had seven robberies in the last, what, two weeks and eight murders. So, I mean, until that gets cleaned up, if I'm actually answering your question, I apologize. If I'm not, then it's going to stagnate. I have four children, and none of them live here because they're working. I got one in Hawaii, one in Victoria, and two down east because there's work there, and there's no work here. So, so anyways, thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah, I came, to, I came to Thunder Bay in 1978 after Great Lakes Forest, Great Lakes Paper, actually, when I was in the University of New Brunswick, they asked me to come down work in the Woodlands Division, and I accepted, and I've been here ever since. And one of the reasons why I came was because of the employment opportunities in Thunder Bay. And unfortunately, those, those uh, working opportunities don't exist anymore, and that's what would draw people to Thunder Bay. So we can see why the population is stagnating. Saskatchewan had a stagnating population for a long time too, but with the development of their mining, potash development, oil exploration, it's increased. Hopefully there is a gleam of hope in this mining sector, but if not, that's facts of life. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Henry. Ken? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of the people who are coming to our community are actually coming from all over northwestern Ontario. 
from those communities that we know, Fort Francis, Atacokin, uh, Dryden, coming to uh, either retire here, they've sold their operations or, their, or retired from, from their places in, in the woods industry, and from uh, First Nations communities throughout Northwestern Ontario. So people are coming here. What we need is new investment that attracts younger people who will stay here and generate a greater tax base. Only through increasing our assessment through new investments that don't compete with existing businesses can we really hope to grow and prosper. So that issue, in terms of how we're going to do it, requires that we get very aggressive in terms of our economic development push and also plan in terms of readiness for new industries such as mining and the supply industry for forestry. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Colin? Well, I was born in 1970, so I can't tell you a lot about before that. But I can tell you I joined the Navy in 91. Thunder Bay was pretty good, well off then. I come back from the Navy and well, we had lost the railroad, we lost a lot of grain elevators, we've lost a lot of middle class, blue collar jobs. Nothing's come to replace them. What do our kids have to look forward to? I got a stepdaughter that wants to move to Toronto or BC. My kids himself, well, my son, he wants to be a firefighter right now. But we need to work on getting the jobs back. When we have jobs, then we worry about entertainment because those are the two key values that make a city grow. If you have a stable work and they're happy where they live, we have to find a way to get some middle class jobs back. We're not going to get the ones we lost back. We got to find them somewhere else. Thank you. Keith? Well, thank you very much. I'm getting a headache already from the doom and gloom in this room, and I don't believe for a minute that the population of Thunder Bay is 110,000. We have 25,000 urban Aboriginal people that we've estimated are living in this community, and I think it's time for a city census. We've seen our uh, tax assessment growth $1.2 million last year, and it's projected to, that our assessment uh, growth will be $3 million next year. Uh, assessment growth and 1% and occupancy rate. We can't build houses fast enough. Something doesn't add up here and I think it's time for a municipal census because it also affects our Ontario Municipal Partnership funding and it affects all kinds of uh, funding from different levels of government. Uh, so I think we need to change those signs because I believe it's more like 120 plus. Thank you. Thank you. Shane? The reality is Thunder Bay is aging and it is shrinking. You only have to look at the one of the latest Renew Thunder Bay documents. That's where I get my figures. Over the last 15 years, the city of Thunder Bay has lost 5,000 people, 5% 5 of its population. The Ministry of Finance predicts that over the next 15 to 20 years, because of demographics, we're going to lose another 7,000 people. The fact of the matter is that the people moving into Thunder Bay balance roughly the people moving out. You all have children who've gone elsewhere because there are no jobs. You only have to look at the a Saturday Chronicle Journal two weeks ago. There were no fewer than 20 death notices and not a single birth notice. Today, 13 death notices. All of these numbers should inform the decisions that we make. And I think as a result of having an informed decision, you should be cautious about where we go. We have to be concerned that in the absence of new growth to Thunder Bay, with a significant number of new people, people who are coming here for jobs, that we have to be cautious about we, what we spend. And in my view, spending on an event center that costs 100 million bucks, when we have $200 million worth of water system distribution costs alone, is crazy. Thank you, Shane. So I'm going to, on this question, uh, throw it open for debate a couple of minutes. So anybody wish to uh, have any further comment? Any of these speakers? Uh, raise your hand. And I'm Keith and Colin. Well, I'm hearing about what we can't afford and, and water rates. Um, First of all, I fought for a $100 water rebate for uh, seniors on fixed incomes, and they got it. And then last year, again, another $100 for a $200 rebate. We did a drinking water system financial plan, 
and it's right here uh, for Mr. Judge because he probably hasn't read it. But this plan does not rely on the use of municipal tax dollars to operate the water authority. Based on the cash flow projections developed in this financial plan, the water authority will be financially viable and provide safe drinking water for both the short and long term. Let me talk about safe water uh, while I'm at it. I was chair of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative and we're already seeing water wars uh, in the world. We have the best fresh water in the world and we have the best drinking water in the world. And if we don't continue to do that, we'll have Walkerton on our hands. Here's how not, they're doing I'm it. I'm not going to have they're that They're going to borrow happen. $70 million. Okay. Dollars. Excuse me, uh, Otherwise, Shane, you're looking at Shane, an 8% water no interrupting, increase, Shane. a doubling of water rates in the Shane. next couple of years. Mr. Chair, Mr. Yes. Chair, I thought we, okay. signed, I thought we right. signed a declaration for yes. a little respect. Okay, I reminded him of that. Okay, Keith. But so, so I invite five everyone. seconds, Keith, to wrap it up, and then I'll recognize Colin and then uh, Ken. Thank you very much. So I, I recommend that everyone read the drinking water system financial plan, plan that we have in place. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Colin? Now I know why this uh, debate has rules from somebody playing their game four years ago. They don't want it happening to them this time. But as for the declining population, the voters list is only 86,000. I can't, I can give you the exact numbers, but I'm not going to. So on a voters list and take into a family of major two people, right? I have two kids at home plus a stepdaughter, so that's three. But you're still looking at a population, voters, 86,000. That's 110,000 people in the city. Our city has been declining. We are an aging population. I myself have lost almost my father, my grandparents. The only one I've got left senior is my mother. So the city is going down and there's no jobs, so that's why it's not growing. The kids are leaving, they all want to go to bigger cities. And as for the water advisory, didn't the hospital just have to go to bottled water the other day? Thank you, Colin. Okay, Ken? Thank you. About 15 seconds, Ken. The issue is that we have to make our own opportunities. All around the world, uh, people are looking for plasma and blood supplies. A couple years ago, they closed the plasma center here, and now the Canadian government is buying their plasma from the United States. And those are the kinds of things that with a leader in the community, you make your own opportunities. You get on the plane, you go to Ottawa, you say, you made a big mistake closing that plasma center here. We want those 35 jobs back here. Colin, or sorry, Henry, last speaker. The incumbent mayor claims that he's kept taxes to a low level, but he mentions non nothing of the fact that he kept the hospital payments on the hospital debenture going, and also another payment, a $19.5 million debenture that just matured last year. So basically, we're paying another $5.5 million that he's not telling us about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone want to speak at uh, the right mic? Come on up. Give us your name and then your question, 30 seconds. Yeah, the name is Ray Smith. <laughs> okay, Ray. The real experts in Thunder Bay are not consultants that live in Vancouver. The real experts are the people who live here and pay taxes. My question is to Mr. Boshkoff and Mayor Hobbs. The people now have enough information. When do we get our vote? All 80,000 eligible voters. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ken, you want to take that one first? Well, Ray, you know very well that uh, I also supported voting to see what kind of money there was out there in the federal and provincial governments. I think without actually knowing that, uh, you're, you're being a little premature in terms of deciding this. Because if you really want all the facts, ladies and gentlemen, you have to know really if there is money in the federal government for arenas. They say it's not part of their, their funding program. If the province has extra millions, then we'll know that uh, probably by Christmas then we will have all the facts. And that's, that's your question. Do we have all the facts? We didn't have all the facts in, in springtime. So uh, that's pretty straightforward, Ray. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, Keith, next. Thank you very much, Keith. 
We have had systematic planning in place for four years for this event center, and you talk about experts. We have hired the best experts in the world. These experts built the Air Canada Center in Toronto. They built the GM place in Vancouver. They built the Budweiser Center in uh, downtown London, and they built the IROC Center in Kingston. These people know what they're talking about. Sorry, Ray Smith, but you don't, and neither do I. Those are the experts, and we... <laughs> And all those, all those event centers that I just mentioned are all successful and they have all boosted the economic, the economic uh, development and sustainability of those cities in the downtown. London, $500 million in new growth, assessment growth in a five block radius. Kingston, the same thing. St. Catharines, I can name every center that's been built downtown. In April, we did not have the uh, ammunition that we have now but we're going to phase four to find out if we can get the money. Thank you, Keith. I'll now ask uh, the other candidates, uh, going starting from Shane, to uh, comment on this question. Shane. Well, there's retail, there's wholesale, of course, and then there's fairy tale. And I'm afraid we're getting the fairy tale. The lack of transparency in the process for coming up with a price of $101 million is appalling. I had an architect who works here in Thunder Bay come over to my house today, asked for a couple of signs, said I'm coming back tomorrow with a check. Because what's gone on as far as the, the, the arrival at this price is what he calls borderline criminal. There's an absolute lack of transparency. These guys just went to a bunch of con contractors and said, okay boys, let's come up with a price. They know that they're able to point to the graph that says the cost of these buildings are up, are going up in quite a, 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 an exponential rate, and that they're going to be able to score because we're a little, little later along in the, in the program with all the other centers across North America, that we're going to have to pay more. So there's a sweetheart deal in my estimation going on. I wanted to see where were the competitive bids for each of the elements of this project. Thank Nowhere you. to be Thank seen. Thank you, Shane. So you'd rather build it in... You'd rather build it in okay. 10 years at twice the cost. Okay. That makes sense. Doug, I can twice the cost I could build in it for Shane, half the price. Shane, twice next speaker, Doug McKay. Doug, years, any Shane. comment? Um, just a personal thing. With PCL that are supposed to build the event center, I worked for them um, in the winter of 87 on the Banff Springs Hotel. It was a lead up to the Olympics uh, and a construction thing, and they were union busters. The reason I got hired on is because the, the their uh, workers went on strike, and then they just uh, fired them all and hired a bunch of scabs. And, uh, excuse me? No, uh, I, let's I, just have comments from the uh, speakers, please. I, if, I if I could just finish, I no, just found it. Can, can I finish? Go ahead, Doug, you got uh, okay. 27 seconds. Yes, okay. I was a scab inadvertently, but I didn't know until months later, actually, because the, 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 the strike lines have been down, that they'd actually done that. So, but yeah. So anyways, PCL is a bunch of union busters, and I wouldn't want them in this town. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, Henry? In 2006, when Lakehead University approached the city to build an event center on the university grounds, the city turned them down. So what has changed from 2006 to 2009? Now we need an event center. The reasoning why is because the reasoning why they rejected an event center when the university proposed it was because we do not have the population draw, as Doug mentioned earlier, and also the Fort William Gardens is structurally adequate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's have a two-minute debate. I'm going to try and get everybody to speak on it, so about 15, 20 seconds a speaker. Uh, Ken had his hand up first. Then Keith, go ahead, Ken. This is one of the largest public projects the city has ever undertaken in terms of public demand and, and uh, input. There is a transparency issue because if there wasn't, so many people wouldn't be upset about it. This facility is one thirteenth the cost of the event center. So you're talking with an order of magnitude that we haven't encountered before. So if you have questions, I don't think there are any invalid questions. 
And in terms of answering the public, I think you're absolutely perfectly clear uh, within your right to do that. And I'll give you an example in terms of, of how the report comes and why I still have questions. A few weeks ago, there was a, a, the issue of disability parking. For, and when I asked which groups had been consulted from the accessibility community, none were. So you can bet I have questions. And I, and I don't want to just see a report. I want to see the, where the research comes from. Okay, so thank I think you, Ken. That, thank you. Okay, Keith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We've had 20 open houses and consultations on this event center. That's transparency, folks. If we build this in 10 years or put it off for 10 years, it's really going to be 20 before it's built. And if you were at the last open house, you'd see that escalation of costs. We'll be paying over double for this event center in 10 or 15 years. That does not make fiscal sense. And Ken, you must have been sleeping on phase three because we, that is a lead gold building and it's accessible. Elevators on every single corner, ramps, disabled parking in front, uh, it's all covered. So I don't know what you're talking about. You're obviously not paying attention. Well, look, okay. I, I know you, this is, you know. Anybody else wish this, to speak? No, this, Ken, okay. okay. Any other speakers? I got uh, Colin first, and then Shane, and then Henry. Got about a minute, gentlemen. Key thing on the event center that I've noticed, and I've been around to many different event centers in the, while I was in the Navy, but they're mentioned St. Catharines and all that, and big cities with large populations close by to support such a facility. As well as another thing I've caught is the Budweiser Center, the First Bank Center, the IROC Center, the Molson Center. What is ours going to be, the Thunder Bay Event Center? So the taxpayers are the one that are going to be footing the bill on this. You should be the one saying we should do it or not. Okay, thank you, Colin. Shane? I want to use... I want to use my 15 seconds to talk about how this event center fits in with the water plan. I, I'm, I apologize for interrupting. I, I thought that was part of the debate. No, we, Keith and I were in, but now everybody to be heard. Anyway, we have to spend $200 million over the next 20 years. The city, in order to keep your water rates from doubling very quickly, are going to borrow $70 million. That gets your rate down to 3% a year. That's all. But for 25 years at a minimum. That's the kind of cost that's going to be incurred by a homeowner in Thunder Bay when we have to also spend more money on a brand new center that we really don't need at this time. I think that when you look at the big picture, which has not been looked at, everybody should hesitate. Thank you, Shane. Henry, did you want to make a comment? And then we'll cut it off. Yeah, I have a pension for actually reading reports, and I did look over that phase three feasibility report, final report. And one thing that really shocked me, that the permit fees were not associated with it. On a $100 million project, that'd be about a million dollar permit fee, but it's not included in the phase three feasibility report. And the other issue, uh, no, that's it, thank you. So there's a million dollars that's not accountable in that report and no one to answer for it. Where's it going to come from? Okay. I'm looking at it. Thank and you, Henry. It. There's, have a time? One comment. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Go ahead. It's the water issue. It's the cost for the water supply. You have to realize that one is tax support and one is rate supported. You get a water tax bill and you get a, a tax property bill. So they're separate entities, so it's not tied in with your tax property taxes. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Henry. All right, we'll go to Lisa Lacko. Lisa, for your question. We've been here for 45 minutes and we've been talking about the event center so far. I'm just reminiscing about a headline in the paper two weeks ago which said, uh, Thunder Bay's wasted election. Let's move it on to a social issue. Good idea. One of the big problems in Thunder Bay that we've all talked about in the last little while is the lack of affordable housing. Poverty is a huge issue in our city. It's at the base of uh, our crime rate. It's at the base of a lot of the issues that uh, keep rising in our city. What is your position on building more affordable housing in Thunder Bay? And Thank I'll ask you, Lisa. All the candidates. Henry, we'll start with you on this one. Henry? Yeah, th that's excellent. Th that affordable housing would be an excellent community econom economical de development corporation project eh? because it will create the jobs it will uh, require local procurement of materials 
And also another factor is so rather than spend the money on event center to boost the economy, maybe we should be looking at social housing. There is an issue right now with the Royal Edward Hotel. I guess DSAP is going to let go of their lease with it and it's going to revert back to the city. That's a 60 plus unit uh, facility. I think maybe the money should be invested into that instead. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Ken. Thank you very much. When we examine root causes of these type of social issues, it really rips at the heart of our community. And I believe that the only solution is to ensure that the community rallies and understands that this is something that must be a priority. When a person doesn't have a place to go, they just end up in a bad, bad space. And the federal government hasn't invested in social housing or affordable housing in over 40 years. It is now an issue of national crisis proportions. The other 5,300 or so municipalities in the country are going through exactly what we are. Whether it's an aging population, whether it's dealing with people requiring special needs, this should become a national priority. And the way you do that is you mobilize the community, you get the support of your other, other associations and, and uh, border municipalities, then you go provincially with the United Front okay. to make Thank your case. You. Thank you, Thank Ken. you. Thank you. Colin? For the housing issue, a lot of that revolves around the jobs too. Nobody can afford some of the houses anymore. Like 400,000 for a house built up off of John Street. So? But uh, you have no yard. Take a look at the rest of the city. Where are the, where are the people moving from? The, as they've stated already, the population isn't growing. There's enough houses here. It's just people have bought them up and they're renting them out. The university students are taking up a whole area. The houses are being used, but no, nobody can buy the houses because banks want high interest rates and jobs aren't there for people anymore. I myself have to rent because I can't buy. So we have to focus on where the city lost it is they privatized all its apartment buildings and now they have to pay the bill anyways too for that. So there's a lot of issues that have to be looked at for all that, but jobs are the key thing for people having housing. Thank you, Colin. Keith? Well, thank you very much. Um, I agree that the feds have to come to the table more, but um, we have a lot of our homeless people are Aboriginal people, and uh, we have to lobby the feds for funding off reserve. I've spoken to the last two Aboriginal affairs ministers about this, and we have to keep the pressure on them for sure. Um, but we do have a poverty reduction strategy that we've entered into this term of council. Uh, homes first, we've checked with Calgary. Uh, we just had the uh, Edmonton homelessness uh, um, pr um, project uh, and they came and spoke to, to us and those are the kind of programs that we have to adopt. Edmonton just reduced their homelessness by 2,300 people uh, due to this plan. So we are planning and we are strategizing, but yes, the feds need to come to the party for sure. We've uh, lowered multi-residential tax rates uh, just this last term of, or this last year uh, in trying to encourage more building of uh, multi-reses. Uh, and we've also uh, uh, looked at other tax rates as well. And we also have to look at uh, homes and um, rental, uh, rentals in homes as well uh, so that we can accommodate some of these people that uh, have struggles. Thank you, Keith. Shane? I have uh, two practical options that I think we should consider. One would be when the uh, Grandview Lodge and Dawson Court are finally closed and the folks move over to cease. Those buildings are owned by the city. I'd take the $33 million the feds are going to give us for an event center and put it towards restoration of those buildings for the homeless. I would also, as a second initiative, certainly invite the nonprofit housing sector and church groups in the city to consider the idea of the creation of a cooperative. The cooperative would approach the provincial government for uh, access to the Lakehead Psychiatric Hospital with the right number of grants, that building could be renovated. There are gigantic kitchens, there are plenty of lands for community gardens. I think people might well want to live in a cooperative sit uh, setting at that facility. It's something that nobody has explored to date, and I certainly think it worth uh, uh, considering. Thank you, Shane.
Doug? Okay. Um, going back to the Portugal model of legalizing all drugs, that will free up. This is not a joke because it actually crime has gone down and usage has gone down. So if you know, before you laugh, you should actually Google it and find out that it's actually the, the truth. And with the prohibition on alcohol, it's the same thing. Gangs and everything, gunplay, it's all because you, you criminalize something. So you, we already have a uh, bloated police budget, so it would be, if you take the money for policing, you know, and put it towards housing for uh, low-income housing, then you can actually build a lot of housing and then have clinics for the people. If you think of Robin Williams, he was a wonderful person, but he was a junkie, right? Now, he, if he had had help, if it hadn't been criminal, he could probably still be alive today. He was depressed. Same with Philip Seymour, right? They're wonderful people, and they're no different than the drug addict that's in the back alley here, right? So let's treat them with compassion, and the money that we save on policing, put that towards housing. Thank, Thank you, you for your question, Lisa. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll open up for another couple of minutes. Uh, Keith, uh, and then Ken, and then uh, Henry. Go ahead, Keith. Thank you very much. Um, the LPH has uh, real asbestos problems and it's owned by the province, so uh, it's a great idea, but then you have to deal with the residents behind uh, that facility as well. Um, I'd like to see Dawson Court and Grandview Lodge um, uh, turned into alternate long-term care uh, because we have a real issue there and those buildings are already there uh, serving that. Um, so although I like your ideas, um, Shane, we need to research that building more. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Ken? Uh, members of the audience, fellow panelists, the, the key component to being assertive and aggressive in your, in your search for new investment is also that you be innovative. And Confederation College and Council just worked out a, a really excellent program with the tax credit for student housing. We have lots of big, sturdy buildings in, in our downtowns. City Council can simply make it easier to convert some of these buildings, whether it's the zoning or some of the other components, so that they can actually move into housing and housing supply. Uh, that infusion of investment, I think that we are all very aware of how positive it has been in the Bay and Algoma area, which really hasn't had a lot of uh, handout uh, grant money asked for. So uh, if we want to do this, we think smartly, we get innovative, and we use what we have to adapt, and that will solve the Thank problem. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Any other candidate? Henry? They talk about refurbishing buildings, and this is what I have a hard time to understand. We have a historical building that's mentioned in that article that, is it, I'm sorry, Lisa mentioned, and that's the Trinity Church Mainz. It's an historical building. All they have to do is apply to the city for funding for it. However, the chair of that council at Trinity Church asked to have it torn down. He's sitting among us today. And also, Mayor Hobbs actually went against the uh, advice of the Heritage Committee, and he said, tear that building down. Here is the perfect opportunity for a community economic development project. Restore the building, maintain the downtown heritage, and maybe give people some accommodation. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Okay, we'll now turn to, to Leith. Leith, your question, please. Um, this, uh, I'll direct that at, uh, at Mayor Hobbs. Um, you campaigned on making the city safer. We've had nine homicides and counting this year, and the perception out there is that Thunder Bay isn't a safe place to live. What specifically will you do to turn things around next term if you're reelected? Thank you very much. Keith? Thank you very much for the question. And I have the 2013 uh, annual report here. Crime, uh, property crime down, went down 35% and 12% on the balance side until this year. And you know what? There's not a mayor in the world or a president in the world that can stop homicides, but there is a mayor in the world that can stop <coughs> or fight the social issues that are plaguing us. And those are alcohol and drugs. And this term of council, I'm very proud uh, with what we've done supporting the street outreach services program with Shelter House. The alcohol management program, you've seen an increase in beds. Just recently in uh, August, we were down in London and meeting with the Minister of Health 
and uh, fighting for a 100-bed detox centre because those are the things that are going to stop crime and those are the things that are going to stop homicides. So for three years, yes, crime rates have come down and I see the Deputy Chief is here tonight that you can verify it with him if you don't believe me, but I do have the annual report here as well. So we are making a big dent in it. Um, I think that we have to have mentorship programs for uh, Aboriginal youth coming down. I used to be a big brother, big sister, and I think those programs are awesome. Okay, thank and you, when Keith. these kids are coming down lost, we need to help them. Shane? Shane? I'm going to go around. Shane? You're... Okay, thank you. Well, I believe my program uh, of giving the Crime Prevention Council $1 million and inviting the community with community leaders, groups that are at the university interested in social justice, applying with a business plan for monies to actually carry out ground base level activities in the community that welcome people from the far north who come down here voting with their feet, landing here with nothing, no supports whatsoever. I think we have to build up neighborhood infrastructure. I think that's the way you get at the problem of the inequality and the uh, uh, abuse that goes on and indeed the racism. I, I think that it's uh, finally time for us after having given lip surface to crime prevention to put some money behind it. And uh, you can go to my website and see how in great detail I outline how this thing would work. It would also make our ward councillors much more involved in their wards urging young leaders to come forward to help develop programs to help the broader community. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Doug? Yes. Yeah, um, the drugs tragedy actually, it, it's just window dressing. You know, as long as you treat addicts as criminals, then it's just going to be recidivism. I mean, you throw them in jail and they come out and they're worse, right? So you have clinics, like the reason we had seven robberies is because these people need their drugs, right? They're coming down, it's in the middle of the night, and what's open? The 7-Eleven or Mike's Marts, right? So you, have, you just go and give them their pills in a clinic, like what they're doing in other countries, then they're not out, you know, terrorizing the town. The reason why crime has gone down, a lot of it is because people don't want to go out at night, and I'm one of them. I'm scared crapless to go out at night, so in my opinion, you know, you, you have to change how you view the, you know, if, whether it's criminal to be a drug addict or if it's just a social issue. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Henry? The incumbent mayor mentioned the crime severity index has gone down in Thunder Bay. Well, it's gone down across the country. When Erwin Waller, the criminologist from University of Ottawa, was here, I guess, before the Crime Prevention Council was established, he also mentioned an, in an article a few years later saying the reason why the crime went down is because we have a lot of technological tools we didn't have before. You try to steal a car these days, you can't hire hotwire it like we used to. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> and, also, and also now we have uh, surveillance, we have uh, house alarms and all the rest. So technology has actually lowered the severity crime index on technological reasons. So it's, not, it's, just a, it's just not a city of Thunder Bay anomaly that's different from the rest of the country. It's a fact of life across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Ken? Ken? Thank you. At the doors, people are telling me that they're afraid to let their kids go to the movies. I don't like hearing that about our city. That's why I propose that we have a rally of a community forum to bring people together. And I would do that immediately after being sworn into office. At the same time, I would also ensure that the mayor was on the police services board. That is fundamental to all of these other organizations coming together. So it's very necessary. When we think about actually pulling all those great number of people who belong to all those organizations, whether it's poverty or the drug strategy or crime prevention, we know that we have a very deep talent pool of caring individuals. What is necessary is a leader who will take a step and bring them forward and get the community engaged so that we can all say, we have had enough and we will do that. Other communities have done it and we can take back our streets too. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ken. Colin? I promised myself something, but I gotta bite my tongue on it. First of all, there's been more murders in the last year than the first 20 years of my life in this city. Something's not right. We have to work together to fix that. Okay, thank you, Colin. All right, let's open it up. Any further comments from any of the panelists? We've got a couple of minutes. Keith, you want to start off? Yeah, I'd just like to talk about the Crime Prevention Council and the, the great work that they have done, and they have done great work. We're building neighborhoods. If you look at Linda Evans and the Evergreen Ogden neighborhood, their crime rates have gone down dramatically. If you look at the uh, Picton Blucher area, uh, under the leadership there, uh, crime rates have gone down. Uh, Mr. Judge, you sound like a politician, you're going to throw a million dollars at it. We've done it with volunteers, and I want to keep doing it with volunteers and build these neighborhoods. Throwing a million dollars at problems don't solve problems. So we a have to get the, we have to get the community involved. We have to get the chance. community involved and keep up neighborhood policing, zone watch, and zone policing. Okay, Shane, you want to respond? Yeah. Well, a million dollars buys you the services for a year of seven police officers. Think about what volunteers could do with access to a million dollars. I'm sure that in a year it's not going to be a million dollars. These things take time to evolve. But we really have to do something at the bottom. You know, at, at, with, with this council, they, they, they want to put a swimming pool when the basement's leaking. We really have to start at the ground level so people aren't strangers anymore. Our rec centers are completely underutilized. With a million dollars, all of a sudden we can get sports equipment, we can get people who are more properly looking after the building so kids can get out to play in safe areas and where families can finally get together and actually meet one another instead of that person being the stranger and all the stereotypes that go along with it. I think we really have to change the way the city looks. Instead of driving everything from the top down, we have to start building from the bottom. And I think my approach with some serious money does that. Thank you, Shane. Ken? Thank you. People need a rallying point. They are really concerned. They're frightened. We need to give our police the backup. We need to give our frontline workers who face these issues daily often not, not even within their job descriptions, uh, taking on other roles. So I believe strongly that we need a rallying point. I believe that this community has addressed problems uh, as great or greater, and that we can do this by bringing people together. It's, it's necessary, and I believe it can be done very soon. Thank, Thank you, you, Ken. Henry, did you have a comment? Yes. Yeah, I think it's noble of Mr. Judge to suggest taking a million dollars of the slot revenues and give it to community centers. Unfortunately, which program do we cut in the budget to provide that money? Or else do you guys want to supply another three quarters of a percent in your tax increase? Thank you. Okay. Shane, did you want to respond to that? We got about 30 seconds. Oh, well, listen, uh, this city has become a bit of a syntax junkie. Uh, the, the money's from the casinos. You know, the casino was supposed to be such a wonderful facility. We we're going to get tourists from all over, and it was going to be terrific. But the fact of the matter is our drawing pool of four-hour drive is something like 430,000, where all these other event centers, it, it's at least two million. Uh, we will find ways. It won't be a million dollars every year. Uh, this thing is organic. It grows slowly. But believe me, as an investment in that, as opposed to policing, you're going to get a way bigger bang for your buck. Okay, I thank you, Shane. I agree with thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to the auditorium again. And the, on, the, on the left speaker, please, your name. My name is Rick Lundstrom. Okay. Uh, one of the themes tonight uh, seems to be transparency. And that being said, I'm going to direct this question to Mr. Boshkoff. In the June edition of Thunder Bay Business, you sign your article, Director of Business Strategies, Krupi Consulting Group. I've heard that the that the Krupi Consulting Group is under investigation by the RCMP. Could you, as a director of this company, please enlighten us as to what this investigation is about? Well, Ken, sir, uh, I just want you to say that asking that question publicly uh, 
is slanderous and libelous. Okay, thank you. All right. Sorry. Sorry. No further comment, I assume? Okay. Ask the question. You don't ask questions. Okay, next question we'll go back. Well, let's take one more from the mic over there. That was short. Go ahead. Your name? My name is Brenda Kreiderman, and I'd like to, I'll direct this question at Ken, and others can respond in different ways. But you've been on council for the last four years, and, you know, you talk about this idea for a rally after the next election about crime, yet I have, what have you done about crime in the last four years? What things have you done that would give people reason to vote for you? What things have you done in the last four years that stand out? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Ken, well, I'll start. Sure. Yep. Uh, I haven't been idle, I'll just tell you that. Uh, besides council and four committees, I'm on uh, probably another 12 or 13 other committees, Intergovernmental Affairs, the Audit Committee, the Assessment Appeal Group, which is appealing the taxes provincially with a a group of other mill towns, I'm on the Conservation Authority, I'm on the Waterfront BIA, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also on boards of directors such as the North, on Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So when you ask me what I have done, I have taken the initiative to join the Chamber's Aboriginal Opportunities Committee to do stuff actually in the field. And some of you seem to, for <laughs> thank you, some of you seem to forget uh, that also that programs like 911 and Crime Stoppers and all of these others uh, were all started by me and, and a group of individuals who really wanted to change uh, the, the channel on how, how the community got involved in crime prevention. So we all pulled together, we all did these things. And uh, I, I, I'm, I, I take great umbrage at the fact that you asked that question in that tone about what I've been doing because uh, there isn't Thank anybody you, in this room that... Thank that, you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, that was directed at Ken. So we'll just go back to uh, our panel now, and I'll ask Ian Patterson for a question. Ian. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're all aware of how some of the rest of Ontario, and indeed the, much of the country, can misunderstand Thunder Bay, who we are, where we are, what we have here. It's, it can be really frustrating to experience that. And this misunderstanding can be costly if um, people think that Thunder Bay isn't worth their time or their investment. What image do you feel that Thunder Bay portrays and how can we improve it if we need to? Okay, we'll start off with uh, Ken. I'm sorry, the question do you want to repeat the question? It sounds yeah. awful from here, I'm sorry. Certainly. Uh, Thunder Bay is largely misunderstood in many cases, and it can be frustrating and it can be costly in terms of uh, people's interest and investment in this community. What image do you think Thunder Bay portrays, and what can we do to improve it? Ken? It has been something that, in my role as the president of the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association, and as the president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, that became quite clear to us that we really had to market us ourselves in a very positive and upstanding kind of way about how many things we have going for us. And it's not just uh, superior by nature, it's, it's the community itself. We're amazing organizer. We've organizers. We've got a phenomenal restaurant uh, cadre of, of development in our community and we're well known for it. So what you do is you market yourself in the most positive light and you get assertive in it, in it and you go to those markets that are most interested in you. I've often felt that our issue in Ontario was primarily geographical, that they don't teach geography and no one seems to know where we are. Uh, when I was president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, I actually had the full map of the province of Ontario put behind the chairman's seat so that people could really get a picture of how big this province was. So how do we do it? You get ag aggressive, uh, you, spend, you spend some good dollars in your tourism promotion, and in terms of your, your people who are doing your economic development, they got to be very sharp. Thank sales. you, Ken. Thank you. Colin? Well, I think I've been promoting Thunder Bay ever since I joined the Navy. When I was uh, out there, we were the land of the sleeping giant. I was stationed on the 
West Coast, but I served on the East Coast, and I always spoke highly of Thunder Bay and our area. When I was in Alberta working at the oil sands, I brought Persians out there and told people, you can only get them in Thunder Bay. And they loved them, all of them, the Newfies and the West Coasters. I've always pushed Thunder Bay as a great place to visit and to live. Now, the worst thing that I hear when it comes back at me, because I still have friends everywhere, that they're concerned about why are we on these crime lists, the highest murder rates, the highest crime rate in the city, in the country of Canada. It's in McLean's magazine, et cetera. It's depressing when we're on that, so we have to deal with the crime issue, get off that list, and promote tourism. Back from the 80s, my father tried to push that, and it still exists to this day. We are a tourist community. We have beautiful countryside here, more so than any other place in the country. Thunder Bay has the views of the East Coast and the West Coast. It's great here. The only thing that sucks is our cold winters lately, but it used to be good for skiing. Okay, Thunder Bay you, is a great city to be in. Thank you. Keith? Well, thank you very much, and I'll segue into that with tourism's up 7% this year in Thunder Bay. We have a beautiful image as a, as a city, and, uh, you know, people are calling it the homicide capital of Canada. That's not my uh, vision of it, and that's not my view of it as well. 114 mayors from the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative just uh, visited the city of Thunder Bay and fell in love with it, and that's mayors of Chicago, Grand Rapids, uh, Milwaukee, uh, you name it, all across Ontario, Quebec. Um, we had an event, and um, or we had a uh, conference, medical conference last year in Thunder Bay. They had to hold it in four hotels, and we had doctors and scientists from all over the world. If we had a first-class event and convention center, we could attract people to come to those shows to have conventions here. But no, we don't want to have that, and I don't understand it whatsoever. Um, our CDC, I'm on the board of the Community Economic Development Commission and we've just uh, commissioned a video that's going to go worldwide in different languages. We have to sell what we have. We have the most beautiful uh, scenery in the world and we're on the largest freshwater lake in the world. And uh, people will be moving here because water is a big issue now. Uh, so you, I'm Chief. proud of our Thank city you. and we have to keep building it. Shane? Shane? Well, Thunder Bay actually has an invisibility problem. There's a famous story at CBC Radio in Thunder Bay about the fact of the uh, associate producer always calling up, does all, all sorts of different associate producers calling up, saying, well, how are things in North Bay? Oh, no, no, this is Thunder Bay. You know, where, where is that? And I'm afraid that Thunder Bay to most of this country is invisible. We used to have a reputation, I suppose, as the big grain handling port, the muscular city by the water with the uh, th uh, three thriving pulp mills. But that image is there no more. Um, when you think about who invested in our waterfront, prime waterfront property, condos and a hotel, we asked the entire country to come and invest in Thunder Bay. Exactly one company did because they had a Thunder Bay employee with a connection here. We really do have an invisibility problem. When they think about us at all, unfortunately, it's because of this murder news, which doesn't fairly reflect us at all. But the only guy who really made a difference in the last two decades, in my view, was Michael Power. He was Thank lightning you, in a bottle. Thanks, Shane. OK, Doug, any comment? OK, um, I agree with Colin. Like Our reputation is for all the wrong things. And Shane actually stole my thunder because I was going to mention North Bay. So I thought if we could petition North Bay to get them to change their name to, uh, <laughs> port, you know, because, because, you know, I am from Southern Ontario and basically North Bay and Thunder Bay are synonymous with each other. So, um, but, you know, I first moved up here in the 70s uh, and I was attracted, you know, I was canoeing in Quetico and I was uh, just blown away by the natural beauty here. So that's how we got to emphasize the, the beauty and, uh, you know, our present mayor actually thinks that marijuana should be legalized and taxed, and that will draw, as in Holland, people fly from all over the world to go and sit in a restaurant and to be able to smoke a joint, like from all over the world. And Mr. Hobbs is a former police officer. He would know it's a total waste of money, and like you say, would actually put us on the map as a city of compassion rather than crime. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Henry? 
Yeah, Doug actually has a point <laughs> because <laughs> there was, a, I guess, George Soros actually that financier actually he recommended to legalize marijuana a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago. I think the chief of Los Angeles police at the same time said legalize, we're wasting our money on police resources. So he has a point maybe to draw some, some tourism into the city. It's a bad way to go, but he has a point. I've worked with people who are addicted to it. I'm telling you, sometimes I felt like buying them a joint. <laughs> uh, actually, for tourism, Tourism, Thunder Bay is superior by nature, and that's one of the reasons I stayed behind in Thunder Bay. I didn't want to go work on my wife's parents' farm. <laughs> that's another reason why I didn't go back to Saskatchewan with her, right? But the area is beautiful, and we are superior by nature. We are a gem in the middle of nowhere, unfortunately. Thank, Thank you. you, Henry. Okay, we have a couple of minutes to uh, respond, debate, Ken. We used to win awards for beautification, for trees, for anti-racism, as cultural capital, as volunteer base. And this season, we dropped from our top rankings as one of the best places in Canada to live to 109th. I believe that we as a community can do the types of things to get us back into the top echelons of that ranking. And we require uh, leadership, direction, some infusion of energy, uh, some, some enthusiasm and some drives because we know why we believe in Thunder Bay. We love it here and we want to make sure that this community thrives. Thanks, Ken. Keith? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, we, have, we have received 11 awards for uh, design and beauty uh, just on the waterfront alone. Lake Superior uh, Magazine, which is all around the Great Lakes, voted us the most picturesque and beautiful city to visit. So uh, again, I'm a glass half full guy. This is the most beautiful city in the world, plain and simple. Thank you. Any other comments on this question? Okay, I'll turn to uh, Vic Krasowski for a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This question is for everyone. Do you believe that there are currently services or programs that the city provides where alternate service delivery options should be investigated in order to reduce operating costs or provide increased opportunities for the business community? Please explain. Okay, Colin, we'll start with you. With me? Yep. I'm sorry, I didn't, the way the speaker is facing, we. I can barely hear that question. Sure. Do you believe there are currently services or programs that the city provides where alternate service delivery options should be investigated in order to reduce operating costs or provide increased opportunities for the business community? Well, part of that I, I look at, we, we've privatized so much in the city as it is and lost jobs and giving the jobs to lower paid jobs. So. It would have to be really looked at if you're going to privatize something more from the city. As uh, we've taken in, perfect example, City Hall is employing Apex security guards right now instead of having like commissioners or something else that I know for working for Apex, that's not a great paying job there. So if we're going to privatize any more, it really has to be looked at. Is it going to benefit in the long run? Because I know how much it could turn around to cost when you privatize something and contract out rather than employ yourself. So it had have to be looked at very clearly and finally to make sure taxpayers aren't going to foot a larger bill in the long run. Thank you, Colin. Keith? Well, thank you very much. I can't wait till uh, some of you are mayor and you can uh, try cutting a golf course and see how much flack you take or, or try and privatize the uh, conservatory and uh, uh, almost got impeached for that, but um, you know, we're on the edge of a huge boom here and Norant uh, Resources the other day said they're two years away and really folks, they are, they just brought property from Cliffs 
uh, Rubicon uh, in, in Red Lake. There's 10 mines set to open in the next two to three years around Thunder Bay in the northwest. That's not including the Ring of Fire, but Norant is coming. We are ready with our ready mine, uh, mining readiness strategy, and I'm not about to cut services right now uh, with that coming, because if we lay people off, uh, if we do cut services, we're going to have to rehire. Um, our citizen satisfaction survey, 90% of the people said they loved the quality of life for the service and the services that they get in Thunder Bay, and 87% said that they like the service for the taxes that they pay. So I'm not going to go against that survey and the citizens of Thunder Bay. So Thank you, we're going to keep status quo. Okay. Oh, sorry. You ready to go here, Shane? I don't believe in privatization at all. I believe that the employees in a, an organization are its most valuable asset. I know that privatization inevitably, inevitably leads to low-cost employees not invested in doing the best job and the profits going to the private sector. It's just the experience is universal. So uh, the only thing that I might consider that we currently own and I sure hope the, uh, the folks at TVTEL are, are do, on the board there are doing their due diligence. We're coming under considerable attack by Telus and Bell. And there may become a point at which time the money it's going to take to stay invested and profitable in that business may require us to sell it. Uh, Maybe too much and require us to sell it. I don't know. I certainly hope they're doing their due diligence on that. But other than that, these public services are too valuable. The employees are too important. They're also important because they set the bar for the rest of the community about wage, where wage, wages should be. They're some of the best paid people in the city. And I don't want to see us driving ourselves down to the lowest bar possible. Thank you, Shane. Doug? It was recently in the news lately um, that Thunder Bay's police service is, is bloated, like per capita we have far too many police. And so my proposal, you know, is turning, you know, drugs into a social issue, would actually, as Shane just said, you could save a million dollars by diverting seven police, you know, eliminating them. So it's not, it's not a joke, actually. It, it's a huge savings, and all we have to do is be compassionate and not, you know, not uh, hammer on people for, uh, for having bad habits. So, so that would actually save a lot of money, is uh, just, is working, you know, just, I think it's a, it's a quarter of the, uh, the municipal budget to, for policing. So, you know, going into that area is actually where you can actually get real savings, as Shane said. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah, the Chamber of Commerce who's sponsoring tonight's forum may actually ask the same question to privatize or outsource services. And yes, I definitely agree we should be looking at it. Thank you. Okay. Ken? Listening to the employees over the past number of years has provided many, many savings and many ideas. One of the first obvious things is that people who have concerns call the city. They may call the mayor's office, they may call councilor at large, they may call their ward councilor, they may call the department directly. A central clearinghouse, like they do in public works, for all departments in terms of issues like that, would immediately start saving time, money, and energy. Uh, let's assume that uh, we listen to uh, the people out there who are seeing road construction this year. If we follow the example and suggestion that we do the infrastructural work first, the sewer lines and all those things, and then do the paving and the curbs and the gutters, then you won't have the issues of time delays that you see on Arthur Street and May Street and some of those other issues. And save the city millions of dollars because then you can also do more projects. When we think about the issues, the, the bottlenecks at the hospital for emergency services and the fact that our police officers and emergency personnel are tied up for hours waiting to process there. I, I believe that we should convene a session that says, come on, we, ha we have to do better. Okay, thank we can. You, Ken keep Thank those you. kind of people. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. you. Keith, you want to get into the two-minute response? Go ahead. 
Yes, uh, just on the um, asset management, we do meet regularly with the board from T-Bay Tell and Thunder Bay Hydro. Uh, that's a must, and they also report to the community as well. And they have, uh, they are very competitive, and they're looking at one of our, uh, their record years this year. We get a $17 million dividend uh, from T-Bay Tell every year. Uh, but we do uh, manage our assets well, and we are looking after that one. And obviously, uh, at some point, we may have to sell those assets. That's not outside the realm of possibilities. And uh, if we sold both those assets and put a half a billion dollars into a heritage fund, we could get $20 million a year in dividends. But now is not the time to sell. But I can rest, uh, you can rest assured that we keep a close eye on those assets. Thank you, Keith. Any of the other candidates want to comment? Anybody else? Okay, yep, yeah, we're going there in a moment. Thank you. Yes, just a moment, please. Okay. Yes, I know, Ray. Thank you very much. All right, and I'm going to uh, the speaker over here, please, in the right mic. Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Bill Sulla. I would like all of the candidates to comment on my concern. I am the private sector. The city of Thunder Bay is planning a multiplex. In that multiplex, there will be an 8,000 square foot banquet hall that will be competing against me and other people in the same business I'm in. I'd like you gentlemen up there to uh, comment on my concerns. I like your thoughts. Thank okay, you very we'll much. Start with uh, Keith. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, Global Spectrum that wants to run the event center, uh, I'm not totally convinced that we should go with them. I think we should go with Bob Halverson and this community auditorium management because they've done a great job. Um, and also, council uh, owning that facility will be able to dictate. And we've already said publicly at open houses that we don't want to compete with hotels uh, or the Da Vinci Center or the Italian uh, Cultural Center. Um, we want to make sure that, that doesn't happen. And by proper local management, that won't happen. Thank you. OK. Shane? Well, my understanding is this facility is going to be run by a third party that we're going to pay $225,000 a year to, and I can only think that that kind of a business would want to maximize its profits. And they can divide that up into smaller and smaller parcels. I don't see where they, that there would be anything to stop them from holding any kind of wedding and completely undermining the local businesses. I just think it's crazy to, uh, to tax these people to build a building that competes against them. It just doesn't make any sense. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Doug? I went to the presentation that, uh, at the Italian Center about the event center, and the numbers they give in that, I think it's an absolute joke to actually think that you're going to have 45, 5,000 people showing up for hockey games. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge hockey fan, and I followed the different professional teams, you know, the Cats and they've been in town and they've all left town. And the same with the baseball team. We just do not have the numbers to support a hockey team of that stature. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, I guess this gentleman named Haywood or something wrote something about convention center follies saying how much tourism you're gonna be attracted by having a convention center in your municipality, eh? So no, I don't think this convention center is gonna to draw too many people in. I know where the ice caps are playing now in, in Newfoundland there in St. John. I guess Mr., uh, who's the premier that was there? Yes, so he, he actually had to postpone one of his hockey games because there was a convention post uh, sponsored in one of his in, his, in his center at that time. So that's one and few between, but this is a, is a gem in its location. Newfoundland is also, they have their convention center built, but we can't get the tourism now, so I can't see how the convention center will draw people. We have enough facilities as it is right now, like the Da Vinci Center, and also the Delta Hotel, I think, is planning to have a convention center in their facility. So, yeah, I, I can see your, your point there, Mr. Sala. Yeah, it would be in competition if the city got into the business of convention center, so it's a bad idea. And that's why I'd like to have it Thank go you, to Henry. the site and let the people decide. Thank you. Ken? Thank you. 
One of the questions that I have not had an answer to is the clear administration, administrative role in the competition between the auditorium and the, and the facility. And it's clear, this, this operation costs the city $778,000 a year. And, but we appreciate it. Can you imagine what it would be like without the auditorium? I cannot, it's, it's a fabulous, fabulous facility. The conference center will be in direct competition with many of the larger weddings and many of the events here that may sell more than 1,500 seats. So we have some issues to be answered. Can they be answered? I do believe that, I, I certainly hope that they can be. Uh, will it be competition for those, those halls that uh, Bill mentioned? Uh, sometimes, some of, the ho some of the hotels that we have now, often, there's no doubt that it is going to be moving deck, deck chairs around. Uh, so we got to get some answers in terms of how those relationships will work. I hope that when the facility is constructed, that it actually draws uh, business from out of town and new business and new conventions, and that's the goal. Thank you, Ken. But, okay. Colin? Colin? Well, this all boils back down to an event center period. It, what my opinion on it really is just, I'm supposed to, as a mayor, if I'm elected, I'm supposed to follow the lead of the people, which you want. My opinion doesn't really matter. I'm supposed to be listening to what the people want by following by what the ward councillors listening to their wards and city councillors at large. So my opinion on an event center, it's moot. It's up to you. It should always be up to you. You're the taxpayers that want to pay for it, or are going to pay for it, not want. Sorry, I could take that back. But as for competition, oh, I'm not against healthy competition to an extent. But I mean, the event center is moot unless you want it. Thank you. Okay. Keith indicated he wanted to respond. Yeah, just a rebuttal. Um, I guess everyone missed the letter on, uh, that was sent to City Council from Bob Halverson, the manager of this facility, supporting the building of a new event center. You can't get any more endorsement than that. And, and I, I, fully support, I fully support Bob Halverson running that new event center as well. He's done a great job with this facility for 25 years. But that event center is going to attract a lot bigger and better shows that can be held here. That's a 7,800 seat facility. Uh, and, you know, we talk about keeping our youth here and, and growing the community. This is going to grow the community. We have done the homework. We've done four years of study. The economic growth that we're going to see in the downtown core, the building of the assessment base, keeping our kids here and occupied and having them uh, being scouted by professional hockey teams and going through the ranks is going to be well worth it. Okay, thank you, Keith. I've got Shane and then uh, Henry. Shane? Well, I'm afraid Mr. Halverson doesn't represent the view of the entire board of the auditorium. I have board members giving me donations saying, fight this thing. They're scared silly. But they don't want to offend the city and get in this organization into trouble. But quietly, they have done so. They're very worried. Thank you. Henry? Yeah. The, the incumbent mayor is stating that this new event center will boost downtown development. What has the new courthouse done for Fort William? What has the Fort William Gardens done for downtown Fort William? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the left mic. Your name, please. Linda Rima, and my question is for all of the candidates. In light of the recent Ebola virus being diagnosed in North America, can you please tell me what specific experiences you have had that you can draw on to lead the community in the event that the virus or some other natural disaster were to strike Thunder Bay? Okay, we'll start with um, Shane. Shane? Keith answered a question like this at the last forum. I think the SETI is well prepared to handle virtually any disaster. I know from my years as reporting of reporting on the Emergency Measures Organization, that they uh, game plan all of the possible scenarios. And we have people highly trained to move very quickly to respond to any kind of disaster. Um, Ebola, I'm sure the hospital's going through all its protocols now to get ready. 
But in the broader scheme of things, such as an oil spill from a tanker, uh, it was explained to me that yes, indeed, there are contingency plans there. I just wish the city would do a little better job of telling the residents like I am about three blocks away from the CP rail tracks how we will be informed. Uh, so there is some work to do, but I'm pretty confident that the people that are planning these things have seen these scenarios. I think that we have an excellent uh, emergency measures organization and an emergency services organization. Our, our fire and police are second to none. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Doug? Yes, uh, I have to plead ignorance on that because I, I really don't know, you know, our special services as far as emergency services, but uh, we're being very isolated, that's one thing we got going for us. We could set up roadblocks just outside of Nipagon. <laughs> so I'm, I don't want to take that lightly, but, uh, you know, that's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah, there are benefits to being isolated, I guess. But we do have an emergency measures organization to answer your question, what experience have I had? I used to be on the safety, I used to be a safety chair for my local union, and we used to always routinely practice chlorine leaks and we'd evacuate the facility. Eh? So that's the experience that I have to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Ken? Uh, this Ebola thing has the whole world on edge, so I, I don't take that question lightly. Uh, a crisis needs steady hands. Uh, we have a, well, a great emergency team here. We conduct exercises in terms of ice storms and fire and dams breaking and blackouts. I've dealt with boil water advisories. I was there for 911 when we were landing the planes and, and leading the team. Uh, in fact, our, our current uh, police chief, J.P. Levesque, called me and said our, our emergency measures person has gone hunting. I think uh, we better act and we, uh, we move quickly and assembled, assembled a team very promptly. Uh, in the, in the, the flood that we had recently, I was on full alert from Friday to Sunday. When I got the call, it was up to me to uh, convene the meeting the next morning. And shortly after that, I declared the state of emergency I was that acting mayor for four days, and the team uh, moved very promptly and quickly. We, have, uh, w we had a great team, and uh, we did what we had to do. Thank you, so, Ken. Okay. Colin? Well, when it comes to st sitting here right now, anybody that's been trained in anything, well, my service in the military, I've been NBCD trained, which is Nuclear Biological Chemical Defense. So. I have the most experience, I'd say, from up here from anything in that respect. But as going against fire department, the hospital, et cetera, no, they're more trained than I am. I know how to save myself and my buddy, but I have planning. I've been trained in that for everything in the Navy trains you, because when you're on a ship at sea, you're it. There's no fire department to call. There's no police department to call. There's no ambulance to call. So you're trained in everything in that respect. Now, I'll tell you one thing, I'm scared for Thunder Bay, and in fact, with our hospital at Gridlock, if we ever had a mass casualty exercise or event, what would happen in that? So I think of that consideration. And when they talk about this flood we had in 2012, I shimmy at the word flood. That wasn't water in everybody's basement, that was sewage. Now that, to me, Alberta had a flood, we did not. So, and that was a, a mess as itself because the city was on the radio asking everybody here and in the city not to use flush water down your drain. Thank you, Colin. They did not close the pools. Thank you. Were they prepared? No. Keith? Well, thank you very much. Uh, the day of the flood, I was in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, addressing veterans uh, from Canada and U.S., but I raced back uh, from day one and took over on day one, so I don't know what the four days is about, but that's neither here nor there. Who better, who better to look after an emergency than a former incident commander with the police? Uh, during the flood, while city council was meeting, I walked door to door uh, to each neighborhood and saw uh, people that were uh, affected firsthand. As an inc incident commander, I've led men and women into dangerous situations, into spills, rail spills. Um, 
Also, uh, bridges. After the Minneapolis disaster, I asked my city manager to do an audit on our bridges. Um, so we're always in a state of readiness. Our fire, EMS, police constantly uh, do exercises in emergency. We have an emergency plan with the city uh, that you can look up on our website. It's there. Uh, the police have an emergency system. Fire, EMS have emergency systems. And uh, when needed, all those come together. We're in constant contact with the hospital. I'm in constant contact with the rail railroads to know exactly what uh, is coming through our city at any Thank you, time. Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do, uh, I think we do have a lot of speakers, has been said, so I'm just going to keep going to the mic, so we'll go back to Sorry, the... Sorry, can I have a correction here, 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 Mr. Speaker? I'll allow you that. Go. Okay. On Friday, the first alerts came out that there would be a, f a flood. On Saturday, they increased. Uh, on Sunday, I got even more calls. So... If I was the mayor, I would have returned right away knowing something was going to happen. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the right mic. Your name, please. I'm uh, Peter Markle, president for Shift Thunder Bay's Young Professionals Network. <laughs> uh, we've heard a lot tonight about the challenges facing our, facing our community with regards to the changing demographics in T-Bay. What specific deliverable will you recommend if elected to attract young professionals and their families to Thunder Bay and engage them in our community? I'm looking for more than just an answer around jobs and crime prevention. Thank you. We'll start off with Doug. Doug? I didn't understand, uh, excuse me, the, the nature of the question is, what are we going to do in Thunder Bay to attract young professionals? Um, well, maybe get into some kind of a, an internet thing here. My, my youngest son is going into his fifth year of computer sciences, and he, he doesn't want to leave town. He, like, he wants to move and live here. But, uh, according to him, he w there's no work in town for his for his vocation. So it'd be nice to start some kind of a, you know, with you know it's uh, what do you call it, artificial intelligence or something with with computers. So maybe try to get something off the ground like that. It can happen anywhere. You know, you don't have to be near Toronto to to be you know have some kind of a an idea. So that's my answer to that. And thanks for the question. Thank you, Henry. Henry. Yeah, the province is offering, I guess, doctors recruitment, doctor recruitment program here in Thunder Bay. That's one way to try to attract the doctors. And then after that, I really don't know what would be the answer to attract the younger people to stay here. Thank you. Okay. Ken? Uh, I, I love that question because uh, really that's, that's what we do. We want to market this community so that people know it's a happening place. Now we have this entertainment dr district. Uh, for us, it's, it's using social media to market in terms of the best of our music, the type of people we're attracting, the kind of filmmakers that are doing things here, uh, the numerous restaurants, uh, that type of activity, and seeing young people becoming successful. As I go around to the businesses, uh, it really is inspiring to see how many young people are starting up, starting up their own business, technologically, uh, doing innovative types of things. So uh, congratulations to Shift for all your innovation. Thank you, Ken. Colin? Well, when I grew up here for wanting to stay here, be entertained, we didn't have an event center, but I had great parks to go to which we've left them in the decline, Boulevard and Centennial. I had Wheelie's roller skating rink to go to. Roller skating, that kept me off the streets. I had teen dance clubs to go to. Manhattan's is one and there's others. There was one on Fort William. I had a Golden Castle games to hang out with my friends. It wasn't about always just playing video games. We, there was foosball, pool, but my friends were there too and well, we were entertained and you meet people. There was a lot more back then than we have now. We had more than one movie theater to attend. We're down to one theater now that has less theaters than we had growing up. We have to get stuff back to entertain people and an event center isn't the only answer to that. We need more. What I would like to see here is somebody bring an IMAX theater here. People are traveling to Duluth and Winnipeg for an IMAX movie because we don't have it here. Uh, a planetarium. Our Anything to entertain, like people go to Toronto for what they see there and what they have there, not just for football, hockey, or sports events or concerts. They go there for what is there, the Science Center. We have to focus more on keeping our entertained here. I know Xbox and all that has taken away a lot from arcade use, but it wasn't always just about games. It was about socializing with your friends. Thank you, Colin. Thank Keith? You. 
Well, thank you very much. I spoke to Shift uh, when they were about 124 members strong and challenged them to grow to 1,000, and they're well over 1,000 members now, and I salute you for that, because you are the future of this community. Um, through the CEDC, and we just finished our 2014-2017 strategic plan, and it talks a lot about bringing youth, attracting youth here. We have to market ourselves better as a city uh, through the internet, through Facebook. I have 5,000 friends on one Facebook page and probably 2,700 on another, and that's how youth today are communicating. Um, biz kids. Through the Entrepreneur Center and the Innovation Center, we have a program called Biz Kids, and I don't know how many of you know, uh, you know about it, but it's school-age kids that are getting into businesses, and, and if they can do it at that young age of 12, 13 years old, um, then that's the kind of thing we have to promote. We have to grow within. We also have to protect the businesses that we have, and that's covered in our plan through succession planning. Um, so we have made a whole new swing and change with the uh, CEDC, and that's the way to go. Thank you, Keith. Shane? I mentioned in one of my earlier remarks the name Michael Power. He's the fellow who was uh, the eminence grise behind the creation of the Thunder Bay Regional Research Institute, which Mr. Jobbett was in intimately involved with. Um, you, you need people like that. He was once in a generation, and it was a real shame that he didn't continue on at Thunder Bay Regional Hospital. Instead, he's gone off to the private sector. In his absence, what I see us having to do is find another person like that within the community. Because I'm afraid that people, generally speaking, aren't thinking about Thunder Bay from the outside. It's got to be people from within the, underside, within the inside. We've got to cultivate them, expand their ideas into real businesses, and have them take it to the next step where all of a sudden they're asking the Siemens and the multinationals of the world to come here and make a business connection. It's so rare that that happens. It's, it's lightning in a bottle, but I think we have to keep trying. Thank you, Shane. One response from Keith. Keith? You know, I, I have a lot of respect and admiration for Michael Power, but this city is filled with Michael Powers. And uh, it's not just one person that's going to make this city grow and thrive. Uh, I can probably pick out five Michael Powers in this audience, so you can't just zero in on one person. You have to expand your horizons. We have to consult with people like Shift, with CEDC, and together uh, we're going to build this community up. Not Thank one you, Keith. Person. Okay, I'm going to go to the left mic. Name, please, and question. Uh, my name's Lorem Kelvy. I, I, I heard on the news something about that great big huge, um, uh, what are those, uh, what are, uh, subsidized housing or something like that? In the low campus part, why don't we get some of the south side as well as the north side as well? It, it's because that's half the problem right there. Okay. Not, not only that, second of all. Have you got uh, a question for yeah, the candidates? Um, uh, um, uh, what do respect in would you respect in doing that um, and, and taking that consideration? Second of all, I, I'm hoping we get get on with this transit master plan pretty darn soon. Okay. Well, I think we've dealt with the housing. It seems to be a housing question. So I'll come back to the right mic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank me and Kim Boschkoff. Thank you. Okay. Right, your right speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Then that's a that's a good question. Thank you. I didn't get that. Okay. Master plan for transit. Okay. We'll start off with uh, Henry. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar if there was a, is a plan implemented. I think we should have hired a consultant to do it. I think there was a report that was prepared for it. I know you don't like to hear about outside consultant, but it's a, it's a field in itself. And I think there was a transit plan prepared or it's in the works. I can't remember. Maybe the incumbent can inform us. Thank you. Okay, Ken? Uh, uh, so, okay, let the, let the speakers answer, uh, answer. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to say that our, our transit department has uh, really done some innovative things in the last couple of years. They've uh, e most recently uh, changing what we knew as, as push 
uh, transit to, or Hagi Transit, sorry, to, to Lyft now uh, has produced dramatic results and, and good changes and is much more efficient and operating very well. Uh, they've got some uh, new young marketing people that are not afraid to uh, bring forward some great ideas in terms of the technologies. You can find out when the bus is coming uh, on your phones. And, and even the new shelters are designed to be more customer friendly, more accessible. Uh, even the, the printing, uh, as some of you know, I'm, I'm on the board of the CNIB and I'm a big fan of uh, using Verdana and, and Aerial Print so that everybody could see, anybody who has any sighted issues can actually read, read the, the uh, street that the shelter is on. So uh, I think that the kneeling buses, the fact that we've converted, uh, we're doing really good things with our transit and I'm very pleased to have been uh, Part of the push thank you, to Ken. get thank funding you. for transit when I was president thank of AMO. Okay, Colin. <clears throat> I think we've gone above and beyond on the buses for handicap use, etc. My only concern, and I think that's what you're referring to, is the time waiting for a bus. Like I grew up, the bus was running every 10, 15 minutes. Now I think it's 45 minutes. Some places, when you're stuck waiting outside for 45 minutes, isn't very comfortable. So I, I would look at that back in the bus transit and having at least a main line every 15 minutes instead of 45 all the time instead of just rush hour times. Thank you, Colin. Keith? Uh, basically what Ken said, we have done uh, great, uh, great strides with our transit master plan, which is a work in progress. It's going to um, seek out efficiencies and uh, routes will be better, uh, wait times will be less. Uh, but I want to just say that, uh, and I know ATU is here tonight, the Amalgamated Transit Union, and we've been, we meet with them regular. I meet with their union constantly because I think the employees are the best people uh, to tell us how to do our job when it comes to uh, those kinds of things. So I want to salute them uh, for helping us out and getting this plan together, and um, it, you're going to really enjoy it. I think it's going to be a, a real step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Shane? Well, I certainly believe in planning for the future for our transit, but I'm a little concerned that the ridership uh, struggles because of the demographics we're facing. Uh, I certainly hope that down the road we're able to, as a city, do a better job of land assembly, for example, in our cores where the city takes over the task of uh, buying old buildings, taking them down, doing all the sewer and water line infrastructure so that we can sell those properties to people who can build three, four-story buildings where you increase the density in the downtown core to make the transit system more efficient. That's a long-range view of the matter, but I think if we're going to keep our costs under control, it's the kind of thing you have to do. The city, in my opinion, is far too broad to the west. We've got to find ways to encourage people to live more downtown. Unfortunately, with oil prices going in the toilet right now, it's not going to be working very well, is it? Thank you. Doug? Uh, as far as the transportation in this town, I usually drive, so I'm not on the bus that much, but I've, I've known a lot of people who have been attacked while waiting for buses, sometimes as simply as for a cigarette. And so, I mean, like we have security at City Hall, you know, protect the inhabitants in there, and we have security at the courthouse and yet we don't have any security whatsoever at the bus stations. And I don't think the people waiting for the bus are any less special than uh, a judge or a, a counselor. So I'd like to see some kind of security system at the bus stops. Thank, Thank you. you, Doug. Okay, any other comments on this question? When, uh, go yeah, go ahead, Henry. Yeah, talking about transit, yeah, I, can, I can share your your issue with transit, Abby, is when we moved out to where we do live, there used to be temporary transit. I live in South Neving. It used to come by maybe a couple of times a week. Eh? So now people with the aging demographics, we have no bus service out there, but yet we all pay a provincial gas tax. And unfortunately, we're not getting any benefits of it. So I'd like to see that bus service at least restored so people who are aging and maybe not driving now can have bus service out there. Thank you. Okay. Go to the mic here again. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is David Sherbarth. I'm from Southern Ontario, and I've had the pleasure of spending five years in Lakehead University. Um, I graduate in April, and unfortunately, since there's no wealth of high-tech jobs in my field, I'll have to go home. 
Um, getting into operating costs. We already own the telephone company. We own the internet company. We have the hydro lines. So if we're so determined to spend a huge bucket of money on a project, why don't we buy the power plant and burn some coal and have some cheap electricity to tell the world that we're open for business? Okay. All right. We'll uh, start off with Ken on that one. Uh, thank you for the question. And believe me that uh, I believe all... All the uh, uh, candidates up here want to keep young people like you, fresh graduates out of Lakehead, working here. Uh, the issue of, of going back to coal in Ontario, I don't think we're going to win that one. Uh, however, can we grow the, the, the trees and the pellets to, to fuel our own uh, converted plant or, or a gas plant? Uh, can we own it? Uh, those are those are possibilities. They're not far-fetched at all in terms of p even partnerships with Fort William First Nation. Things can be done. So uh, there may be opportunities rather than than mothball it or dismantle it uh, that the uh, municipality and and other partners probably could could come to the fore and do something positive with it. So your idea has merit. I'll just say that. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Colin. To be honest, I, there's no easy answer to that other than the fact that, as stated, we can't go back to coal. Uh, natural gas is another hassle on its own. The wood we're not going to grow anymore. Without, we've already lost the sawmills because of the lack of wood. Pellets, there's a, there's a possibility in that, but I mean, every time something's tried to grow to make use out of byproducts like the popsicle plant in Merlot, they didn't last. I, I like your idea of trying to keep something here and get more. I'm open to ideas to how to fix that and keep it that way. I'm sad to hear that you have to go back south, but because of how Thunder Bay sort of kept everything out and kept on hoping for the ring of fire, we're behind the eight ball and figuring out problems as it is now. Thank you, Colin. Keith? Thank you very much. Uh, when we heard that the OPG plant was going to close, we saw, uh, formed an energy task force. Uh, we have taken this issue to the government. Uh, coal is out. All three uh, provincial parties are against it, and the Green Party as well. Um, but we have been fighting to convert that OPG plant to natural gas. Uh, that plant has a 306 megawatt uh, capacity, and we're going to need that capacity when the Ring of Fire and other mining hits us. So we're going to continue that fight uh, for sure, um, because it, it provides jobs as well. Um, we've seen that plant cut in half because uh, two units have closed down. We're going to continue that fight. We have uh, experts, uh, Larry Hebert and Ian Angus, on that energy task force uh, that know their stuff, and other people like Rod Bosch from used to be with Hydro, and uh, we're going to keep that push to keep that plant open. It's vital for the growth of this community. Thank you, Keith. Shane? Shane? My reply is merely an observation. Why is it that Ontario Power Generation is fighting back so mightily against the city that it's not interested in making the conversion? They've seen the demographic numbers. They, they look at the picture and they're cautious people too. They don't see any immediate need for that extra power. That would be my observation, that they're, they just aren't ready right now to make that kind of investment. With the city, with, with rather the province in debt like it is, they just don't see going forward. And that's the sort of precautionary principle that I'm asking folks to th consider when it comes to the event center as well. They're worried about demographics. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Uh, in answer to your question there, uh, if I was elected mayor, I would uh, lot some revenue towards getting together with the young thinkers in this town and coming up with some kind of a, an idea to go with it. Because I, this town has always impressed me with the, the amount of intelligence, like with, for musicians and, and technology and stuff like that. So it's just a matter of fo focusing that energy and coming up with an idea. And I'd be sad to see you have to leave town as my children have. Thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah. Our, our mill manager, he sits on Ambassadors North now at present, but he actually approached OPG Thunder Bay if they can buy the OPG Thunder Bay power plant, because at the time the mill was paying up to, I think it was a million dollars a week for energy costs. So your idea was considered, they turned them down. But another thing is kind of hard, how could you tell a province a few years back, 
some of the very same people who sit on the energy task force tell the province, no, we do not want to convert to natural gas. We want to stay on coal. And now they're going back to the province. Now they're saying, no, now we want to turn back to natural gas. You're giving them mixed messages. Actually, I approached our MPP and I said, you know what, why are we wasting our time? I think uh, Dr. Uh, M MP Fletcher from Manitoba, it was an article in the Chronicle Journal, and he stated, why don't we open up the Kanawapa power plant on the Nelson River? And that's what I proposed to him maybe 10 years ago at his first open house. Unfortunately, the Liberal government turned away from that idea. We would have had 1,300 megawatts coming into Thunder Bay, and it would have probably serviced the northern, part, northern reserves. Unfortunately, they didn't go through with that idea and maybe they should have pursued that. In hindsight, it's unfortunate. But to keep, I don't even think they should be keeping this OPG Thunder Bay open. The Ontario Power Authority would probably close it down if it wasn't a okay, ministry thank directive. You. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to, uh, I'll give Keith one comment and then I'll go to the left mic. I'll just keep it really brief. Uh, we're not fighting with OPG, it's the Ontario Power Authority. When we started the Energy Task Force, our um, projections for load were 2,000 megawatts, that's our capacity, that's what we needed. Uh, they were at 750 megawatts. They have now come up to 2,000 megawatts. So our, our energy task force has the experts. They don't know what they're talking about, but they have now caught up to where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Okay, left mic. Good evening. My name's uh, Robin Rickards. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the uh, the, the assembled uh, mayoral candidates, and it's uh, it's nice to see uh, such a showing of our citizens out to get informed about where each of the candidates stands. The, uh, the question I want to ask about, I think, uh, goes to the crux of uh, the problem we have with taxation, not just in Thunder Bay, but across Ontario and across the country in general when it comes to property taxes. And I'll preface with a, with a few local examples of how it costs us. Administration prepared a report a number of years ago that indicated that Water Street was running at about half capacity. Uh, they estimated that it could handle about uh, 40,000 vehicle trips a day and at the time it uh, ran 20,000. Fast forward to, uh, to this year and we see an expansion of Gulf Links Road because of pressing traffic concerns at, uh, at $19 million. At the same point in time, out in South Niebing, we see the, uh, the need to relocate the Brown Street Station to accommodate more homes in South Niebing within the six minute 90% response time range, while at the same time the move of the Brown Street Station will remove areas of West Fort from that same coverage zone. Okay, and can I we have the question, please? The question is, given examples such as that, what steps do you think the city needs to take to encourage increased density in the city and limit the urban sprawl that is driving our taxes through the roof? Thank you. Okay, Colin, we'll start with you. You're starting, yeah. I believe they've already started that when they've removed the limit on the height of buildings in the downtown core. But the, the largest concern in that is once you start building higher in the central area, you're obscuring the view of people that have had houses for almost hundreds of years up going up the hill of the lake. So we're a diverse city because nobody wants to build up in that sense because we don't want to ruin the view of the lake. So it's a hard question as to how would we do that. It's, there's, I can't see any way in focusing, like I, I think the, the condos on the waterfront now in our marina park was a mistake. So if you want to build a higher apartments, you have to pick a location that's not going to interfere with other people's views because they'll fight you on that. But there are existing places now, which I did hear that somebody did buy Hillcrest. But then there's also where the Port Arthur General Hospital was. Those are area, key areas that had tall buildings that could be developed again by somebody or for something else besides that. So we'd have to focus on keeping our view and keeping our city beautiful by not ruining views for those that already have places. So it's diverse, we are, we are spread out because people want the view out in Niebing, they want the view of the mountains. Okay, and thank you, Colin. Et cetera. All right. Keith. Well, thank you very much. In the last four years, this term of council, we worked very hard on intensification and keeping the city from uh, that urban sprawl that you talk about. Uh, the condos at the waterfront, they're controversial, yet they uh, um, help with intensification. You're building your city in and not out. 
Um, we just approved uh, two high-rise condos on Beverly Street much to the chagrin of, of some people in the neighborhood, and you're always going to have that uh, when you look at intensification. We've lowered our multi-tax rates uh, so that we can um, hopefully get more multi-residential buildings built, uh, and that's intensification as well. Uh, I want to go back to taxes again. From 2002 to 2010, our, our tax levy increases was 4.16%, and no work on infrastructure. Since I've been mayor, 3.18% and 1.5% of that has gone into enhanced infrastructure. If you took that away, your tax increases would be 1.68%. But we left with a crumbling infrastructure and we decide to fix it as a, as a council. Thank, Thank you, you, Keith. Shane? Shane? I've already mentioned my proposal for the city taking the, the four on uh, land assembly in the core areas and then allowing the private sector to come in and build uh, commercial on the ground floor and two, three, four stories above. But the market will drive that. I also believe that uh, there is an opportunity, as Colin has suggested, for a great deal of intensification along the ridges of Thunder Bay. I think that we have to be much more liberal in our approach to the zoning in that area. They're now with uh, many aging, uh, housing, much aging housing stock in that area. And I think that uh, if the zoning was made easier for people to come in, developers to come in, uh, that we could have much more intensification there. I would also say that I would encourage developers who are now experts in putting in sewer and water lines to find a different approach. I want to see builders who are experts at infill. That's something we're really missing in this city. And as mayor, I would work with that industry to change their methodology. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Uh, when I first moved to the city in the 70s, we had rather vibrant downtowns. And it seems to me right now that there's a lot of you know, places, empty lots in that in both Fort William, especially Fort William in Port Arthur that we could build you know, low rise. And I'm all about community. Like inner city is soulless and it'd be nice to have some kind of a, a community like we got going on Bay Street right now. We got really cool stores and we, and we got a, a real good vibe going on there. And I'd like to see that in Fort William, but, but actually concentrate on the, on the downtown areas and then you, you know, there's less sprawl. So, that, so utilize the downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah, our urban intensification is an excellent way to reduce costs for municipalities. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I can agree with you there, but I do like my space. I was raised in Montreal, and believe me, I do like it in the countryside. But however, your issue about the uh, fire stations, I actually approached, approached council when they were bringing in the fire management strategy, and I said, why don't you join those two fire stations together, just replace it with two with one, and actually get rid of a whole team of firefighters, don't get upset, you know, and reduce costs, because right now, I think some of our council members went to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and they said that the costs for emergency services are unsustainable. That could have reduced our costs a bit, but unfortunately, they didn't heed my advice, and they built two. And you know what, there's no reason for a six-minute response time in a rural area. That's something that this report put together. But in other municipalities, 10, 15, half an hour, depending where you are. We didn't need that 22nd Street fire station rebuilt. Actually, maybe we should be closing one. Thank you. Thank you. And Ken? Thank you, and thank you for your question, Robin. Uh, when I started as, as mayor, the city was on its knees. Uh, but we worked with other municipalities. We organized, we mobilized, we lobbied the federal government, we lobbied the provincial government. We got the Prime Minister to change the wording from just big cities to include the word communities, which allowed us to be part of that funding agreement. And the first funding agreement that we secured was a 5% share of the gas tax, which presents us with about $7 million annually uh, for our infrastructure, streets and roads, and, and whatever we decide what we want to put it into. Further, we then lobbied the provincial government and we got a 2% share of the provincial gas tax for transit. So many of the things that Loretta asked about in terms of the provincial uh, 
transit plan uh, came from that. So that to us is worth somewhere over $9 million a year. And at this time, I'd just like to thank those councillors uh, from previous councils who, who helped and from the surrounding municipalities who also were staunch allies in lobbying for that money. So thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Ken. Okay, Lisa, I'm going to ask you for the next question, please. I'd be delighted. We held a forum recently at CBC Radio in Thunder Bay, one we called Burning Bridges. And what we were asking was, how can we build bridges between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this city. I would like to hear from each person as to what they would do to combat racism in Thunder Bay and to build a healthier community. Thank you. Okay, Keith, we'll start with you. Keith, Sorry, you can lead it off. Thank you very much. Well, I don't think anyone has done more than this mayor to build bridges with Aboriginal people. My first three visits, uh, we're to Northern Communities, Webekwe, Abimitung, Fort Hope. Uh, we have a uh, respect campaign. We have a diversity Thunder Bay. We have an urban Aboriginal strategy. I recently uh, called out First Nations to do more work with us. And last week, uh, or three weeks ago, I met with Nan, Nishinaabeaski Nation uh, Grand Chief and Deputy Grand Chiefs. This past week, I met with uh, Matawa Council and they uh, handed me a piece of paper that says, therefore be it resolved that the Matawa Chiefs Council of the 26th Annual Matawa Chiefs Assembly support the City of Thunder Bay in their attempts to deal with First Nation crime related issues through the establishment of the Crime Prevention Committee. And further be it resolved uh, that we develop a strategy process in collaboration with the City of Thunder Bay to address the needs of First Nations people. Um, you know, I've called, uh, as a mayor, we've called for an inquiry into missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Uh, eight uh, women are eight times more likely uh, to be murdered uh, if you're Aboriginal. Uh, we did that unanimously. Okay, thank uh, you, Keith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shane? One of the key goals of my plank in my platform of investing a million dollars in the Crime Prevention Council is to try to rid the city of the scourge of racism. I've argued earlier in this evening that the only way that we can address that sort of thing is by working from the bottom up. I'm hoping that leaders will emerge eventually so that you don't have six old white guys running for mayor. But that only comes with a lot of time and effort. <laughs> It is my hope that ward councillors and councillors at large will both reach out to the Aboriginal community, invite these people to come forward, to put together business plans, proposals to the Crime Prevention Council, to start programs in neighbourhoods where finally the non-native and the native people will meet and play. I think play is the answer and we're not doing it now. You've got to have smiles on people's faces, and I think with a little bit of money for the equipment, the facilities, that we can begin to learn to love each other instead of being the stranger to each other. Thank you, Shane. Doug? Uh, when I first moved up here, what I noticed that I liked the most was actually the, the First Nations people. There was, I never actually met a First Nations person when I was down east, and I just fell in love with their sense of humor, the ability for them to laugh at themselves. And I actually have a native nickname, it's Waboose, which means rabbit, and it was to do with my diet, not my sex life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so, but I, I just love the native culture. Just uh, I have a TP. I've had a TP for 40 years now. And I can go, you know, go into the bush every summer and I build a sweat. And uh, so I just, you know, like last week I got uh, chosen to be played for a, a baseball team that's all native. So I'm the only whitey on the team. I just, I just really think I have the personality and the love for the culture to, to uh, build a bridge or, uh, you know, because, you know, the native, you know, in, in Europe people love the native culture. So we need to advertise that and get them to come over here and uh, take advantage of a very unique culture. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Henry? Yeah, having been raised in Montreal, I don't have an issue with discrimination because my best friend was actually Chinese. 
And when I went to work in northern Saskatchewan my first summer, I, did, I was in northern Saskatchewan, we were cutting road line. We were actually trans, trans, going across Native, native uh, Reserve, I guess, eh? then we weren't told. Our bosses never told us this, so we're in camp, and then two elders come by in their canoe with shotguns, eh? and they said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, we're putting a, cutting road line through your property, but it was negotiated that we'll build them a boat landing. But I never had an issue with discrimination. Actually, I think this Urban Aboriginal Council is discriminatory in itself, in my view. So I think we should abolish it and just live and let live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ken. Thank you. Other mayors, I have to say, worked very hard and very sincerely on this file, so I, I, I don't think that... Uh, someone trying to claim that they did more than anybody else is fair. Uh, we as a community also won a Provincial Anti-Racism Award, and I began a series of things called the walkabouts. I don't know if they've ever been copied since, but uh, I visited every Native organization in this city for a, a process of meeting face-to-face -face with people called Tea and Bannock and 67 organizations over a period of a few years. So I met with everyone and let them know that they were welcome in our community. As the first president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, I had an outreach with the leadership of all the major uh, First Nations, Aboriginal and Métis organizations in the province. I sat on the, the national task force on uh, Aboriginal, uh, urban Aboriginal uh, issues. I had a policy of open communication with every group in the, in the community. I belong, as I mentioned before, to the Chamber of Commerce Aboriginal Opportunities Committee, and I was asked to moderate the first historic meeting between the mayors and chiefs of the Fort Francis and Rainy River districts, which proved to be a very successful exercise in bringing people together. Thank you, Ken. And Colin? Racism. I myself grew up not even knowing what that was really. I was born here in Thunder Bay, yes. My grandparents were Finn. My other grandparents were English. So I'm Finn and English. My spouse is Italian. My parents brought me up to the point where, you know what, I called uh, my sister's best friends. They were my sisters. One was Jamaican, one was Asian. I have no fa racism. I grew up, my parents worked at the railroad. I was out in Wraith, Ignace, all those other Railroad communities, my best friends were native. Never grew up with any racism comments. Nothing to me in that respect. Why is it so valid now? I mean, we live now, we plan for the future, and you learn from the past. If you dwell on the past, you doom yourself to make the same mistakes. So racism is partly at home and how you're brought up. And if we keep diversifying and saying we're different, we're all Canadians here. And that's general, but then we're all from Thunder Bay too. Everybody said it in their own way. Just treat everybody like you want to be treated yourself. That's how I was brought up. If you dwell on racism, you will create racism. Let's bygones be bygones and everybody just respect each other. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colin. Okay, and... Uh, the last question of the panel will come from Leith. Leith? I guess uh, to everyone. Um, what specific businesses or uh, industries would you court to put Thunder Bay back on the right economic track? Okay, let's start with uh, Doug on that. Doug? Um, I'll go back to um, the baby boomer, baby boomers. I will be one. Well, I'm actually on the tail end, but, but there's going to be a huge market for retirees. So my focus is going to make Thunder Bay a, a safe place and advertise, you know, for people, you know, because the real estate is, re, you know, relatively cheap here compared to anywhere else in Canada, especially the coast or Toronto. So, so that my answer is to turn it into a retirement mecca. Thank, Thank you. you, Henry. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure the CDC is actually working on that problem right now. What kind of industries would like to court the Thunder Bay? And they don't have the answer. Maybe my former boss is actually the chairman of that uh, organization, so maybe I'll be asking him those questions. Thank you. Ken? 
Uh, I believe there are, are many, and actually uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see our economic development organization uh, dovetailing with the provincial goals which they feel that Northern Ontario is best able to attract, and that is mining supply and readiness and, and outreach to the, to the Alberta tar sands and Western, Western Canada developments, uh, the resurgence of the forest industry and its new capacities, uh, the fact that uh, Film, filmmakers have come here in numbers and are producing uh, terrific, terrific materials. We know that we have all the assets in terms of site selection and uh, scenery to do that. Uh, at the port, uh, as someone who worked in the port as a director of marketing, uh, there's a big gap. We, we know that uh, for transportation in the business side, modular uh, facility for containers is long overdue. Uh, so when I think of what we can do and what we can fo focus on, certainly the resurgence of the forest industry uh, and the research and training people to do the jobs in those industries. We can use our educational industry. Uh, institutions to build a huge new in industry here of attracting international and national students. Thank you, Ken. Colin? My grade three teacher hit it on the head when he brought his computer from home to school to teach his computers. To this day, I don't regret him making us learn computer code. Computers are our future iPhones, smartphones, that's the way. We, technology, we had the one gentleman here from the university saying he can't find a job here, he's gonna go south. We have to focus on technolo technology. We can't rely on the ring of fire. That's up in the air to when, if, maybe. Who knows about the ring of fire? As for wood and everything else, the sawmills, we've lost them. It's gonna take decades for them to grow back. So we should look at a technologically based endeavor and keep it here. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Keith? Well, thank you very much. Uh, when I got on the CDC board, I didn't like the direction and uh, we talked as a board and um, we have a new um, uh, C CEO of CEDC now, Doug Murray, and we also hired John Mason, who is working in the mining sector uh, for the province and uh, we're making great strides. We uh, presented a mining readiness strategy uh, with uh, different partners, including Fort William First Nation, getting ready for that. But Bombardier was a prime example of a pretty scary situation and I think we have to lobby federal government to uh, have 60% Canadian content so that we can make those manufacturing uh, parts uh, in Thunder Bay rather than Mexico. Instead of having substandard parts, uh, we should build them right here. So I think that's a real good one. Zenyatta, the, the biggest graphite find in the world right now, and uh, graphite is used in batteries. And I've been meeting with the chief of uh, Constance Lake and CEO of Zenyatta, and I think that's a real uh, good one for Thunder Bay as well. So let's build a battery plant here. Uh, the world is our oyster with all the mining that's going on around us. Okay, thank you, Keith and Shane. My grandfather started a food brokerage in Thunder Bay in the 1930s, and uh, he was always asked, uh, why'd you do that? And he says, people got to eat. And I take the corollary from that, people need a place to live. So to answer your question specifically, I think there might be a real opportunity uh, trying to attract a company that would make prefabricated houses. Uh, we have a wonderful supply industry, electrical, plumbing and otherwise in the community. I think with the right cooperation uh, with the C uh, Community Economic Development Commission that uh, such a company could be enticed here but given, the, given the raw materials that we have growing around us. I think it's an unexplored opportunity that uh, in the narrow sense of your question, that's <coughs> what I would be uh, going after. Thank you, Shane. Okay, I would, uh, I think I uh, would like to thank everybody for the questions that they put forward. And I'd like to now call on the uh, candidates for their closing statements. Uh, they're each going to have two minutes to speak. And the order was selected uh, by uh, draw before the evening started. And so the first speaker will be Ken Boschkoff. Two minutes. Thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. I'm running to be your mayor to ensure two things that the many good things that are happening in our community continue, that they can, can continue to strengthen us. And secondly, that we face the more difficult 
questions head on. The social issues of crime, homelessness, that are causing so much worry and concern in our community. When you balance that about what we have accomplished, we have had extraordinary successes. This facility, the med school, the law school, the hospital, audit the Jeu Canada Games, the PGA Golf Tournament, it goes on, the list is, ex is exceptional. And it's done because this community pulled together to make sure these things happen. The individuals who we have that have made this city famous in the arts, in music, in engineering, in medicine, significant players, people that we can call on to help us move this city forward. Can we tackle those most difficult of social issues? Uh, I believe that other cities have faced them and beat them down. So I believe that by rallying as a community, yes, we can do these. Can it, what will it take? Truly, I believe that it's proven experience that we can make the positive changes, that you have to love this community, you have to believe in its future, we have to organize and roll up our sleeves, and I would represent you the way you want to be represented. I'm here for you, I've always been there, and I will be here whenever you need me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Next speaker will be Shane Judge. Shane. Thank you. This election is about our city's priorities. You have a choice. On one side, a $114 million gamble on an event in Convention Center. Will it host a long-lasting AHL franchise that won't require a subsidized rent? Will it bring a regular stream of visitors to attend conventions in a North American market flooded with similar facilities? Will significant private investment follow and revitalize the North Core after only one company from across the entire country bothered to show interest in buying our prime waterfront land for condos and a hotel? I have grave doubts about all of these core issues. On the other side, you have a road system the city manager admits needs millions of dollars worth of repairs. You have a storm sewer system across Northwood and inner city that needs to be upgraded to handle the heavier and damaging rainstorms we experience. You also have a water distribution system that needs $200 million in investments over the next 20 years. That's after your water bill has already gone up by 60% in the last six years. You can't operate a new money-losing event center and fix up our basic infrastructure without raising the cost of owning a home in Thunder Bay by a significant amount. These choices are backdropped by an aging and shrinking population. There are 300 fewer students in our public high schools this year compared to last. A trustee told me recently that not long after this election is over, the process of closing another high school will begin. He says the writing is on the wall. Until our population stabilizes with the arrival of a significant number of new jobs, we should heed the precautionary principle. The Fort William Gardens will do for a decade. Focus instead on reducing crime by investing in our neighborhoods, creating communities where now there are only strangers living side by side. If we want to keep taxes to a level where our young people aren't forced to flee to other jurisdictions, we need some cost controls. And that's not what you get with this overpriced event center. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> the next speaker, Doug McKay. Doug. Thank you, Keith. Um, for those people that stood up and never had their questions answered, if you want to get hold of me on Facebook, Doug McKay, I'd certainly like to tackle your questions. I agree. I agree. But uh, anyways, that's the best I can do in that situation. But I'm going to speak from the heart here. I've traveled extensively in every geograph geographical environment in North America, and I have found that there's a distinct blend of people in Thunder Bay here. I, and I can't really put my, my finger on it, but it's, it's, it's very unique. And considering that when I first moved up here, this well, was resource-based, and that's pretty well fallen by the wayside now. So, But we, our best resource here is going to be people. I just, they're like, I just find Thunder Bay friendly, and, um, and I think you know, if we can attract people to this town, then you know, people are going to be our best resource. Um, another thing I'd bring to the table is um, I just love physical activity, 
and in nutrition. And I know that Thunder Bay has a serious problem with, you know, ill health, we want to call it obesity and uh, diabetes and such like that. So I would do my best to um, bring my knowledge about nutrition and, and, and promote all kinds of physical activity to make this a healthy place to hang out in. Um, I guess that's about it, actually. Just, uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out and the media. And Keith, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Keith Hobbs. Keith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the past four years, we have witnessed leadership in the mayor's office. We have had one of the most functional councils ever. We have paid down city debt. Our tax base saw significant growth. Business taxes decreased on average 9%. Our credit rating has improved two positions. Our debt to reserve ratio has vastly improved. Tax increases have been the lowest in decades. We have put $253 million into fixing our crumbling infrastructure. Over $600 million in building permits rest, resulting in new hotels, restaurants, condos, clinics, fire halls, and the list goes on. Thunder Bay is now open for business, ladies and gentlemen. This is evidence of the city on the move, not in decline. Four years ago, our waterfront was unfinished, and some people told me it never would be. Four years ago, the wind farm was looming. Today, it is nowhere in sight. Property crime has de decreased dramatically, and up until this year, so had crimes against persons. We need to keep investing in programs like street outreach services, alcohol management, shelter house, crime prevention council, and building neighborhoods. Our 2010 to 2014 strategic plan was a success and we covered off most of what we set out to do. We have a mining readiness strategy. We're working on a stormwater master plan, transit master plan, poverty reduction strategy, drug strategy, and many more. We're ma mapping out where we have been and where we are going. If we fail to plan, then we might as well plan to fail. And I do not plan to fail. I'm not surprised that we have so many people running for mayor. I had actually expected more. Why wouldn't anyone want to capitalize on all that we have accomplished this term of council? And I respectfully request the citizens of our great city elect me, Keith Hobbs, to be your mayor on October 27th. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Colin, Colin Burridge. I'd like to thank our host tonight, the Chronicle Journal, the Chamber of Commerce, and Shift, which, well, I think I missed somebody too. <laughs> All of you for attending. I think this is uh, more than the last four years ago. I ran four years ago because of my concerns on the waterfront and other problems. I'm running again for a second time because the same problems exist. As I said, crime, violence, murders are higher in the last year than the first 20 years of my life here. That has to be addressed. Our waterfront, we had a waterfront before four years ago. The waterfront was designed by Port Arthur back before the cities of were amalgamated and was constituted. I recall a restaurant on the waterfront, et cetera, before. We're just cluttered it up now with condos and a hotel that weren't needed there. Now, an event center we want to throw on the same footprint as a, the existing one in Fort William Gardens. I say, why are we going to do the same problem and move it from the south to the north core? And parking, parking is an issue here. I don't care what anybody says, nobody's going to walk 13 minutes in our winters to go to an event in here. I want to give you the politicians that you all want back, a politicians that's going to listen to you, the people, and not the other people behind the doors. I want to get back what I had growing up here, a city where I didn't have to worry about walking around at night. I have the training in the military to do things that somebody that says, who better? I'm better. I said it in four years ago, my ideas were taken and failed. I have great ideas for this city, and I won't take credit for others' ideas, because there's a lot of people out there with some good ideas as to what to do. Now, Thunder Bay needs somebody that's going to listen to you guiding it, because without you, there is no Thunder Bay. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Henry Wojcik, last word to you, Henry. Yeah, thank you all for sitting patiently and listening to us, and I thank the sponsors for this forum. For, for this last 
four years, we had a new city manager and he has led this council very well. It is time that we have someone that gives some direction to the city manager because the course he's on is not sustainable for a lot of the people in this community. So I'll be that voice if you decide to elect me as your new mayor in October 27th. Thank you. Thank you, and this will conclude the evening. I'd like to thank the candidates for being here and answering the questions, the panelists for addressing questions, and importantly to you, the uh, electorate, uh, the questions you asked, and hopefully you've been enlightened this evening. So I'd like to uh, thank the netnewsledger.com for live webcasting, and to Shaw Cable, who will air this program numerous times before Election Day. Special thanks again to the Thunder Bay Community Auditorium for hosting us this evening, to our media panelists for their participation, and to the Chronicle Journal, Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce and Shift, and the, uh, for coordinating the event. Finally, again, thank everybody for being here, and please remember October the 27th, time to vote, put your voice forward, and uh, remember there are advanced polling. So once again, Thank you all for coming out. Good evening.